Encased in the cold dark, you cease to be a flesh and blood thing, but become a memory thing, a thing of stillness. To have memory is to be storied, and to be storied is to be worthy, yes. But to be still is to be dead. We have not been still since the long drift, and we will never be still again. In the last video, I spoke about the light elements. I spoke about how each of them can be explained as our guardian having control over three of the four fundamental forces of the universe. However, that conveniently leaves out the fourth element, the newest element, the darkest element. Stasis. Is stasis that fourth fundamental force? Well, short answer is no. The fourth fundamental force, as I said before, is the weak nuclear interaction, and it's what causes particles to decay. It's what makes uranium and plutonium radioactive. So that doesn't fit well with what we see for stasis in the game. So what is stasis then? What if I told you that it was the control over a deep universal phenomenon, the thing that makes time into an arrow and gives it direction, the thing that will ultimately be the end and the death of our universe? What if I told you that stasis is the control of entropy? You'd probably say, whoa, whoa, David, quit being so fucking melodramatic. This video was initially going to cover stasis and the other theorized darkness elements. However, I made the executive decision to only cover stasis for now because we're gonna have to cover quite a lot of ground with this one element. But I'm going to try to make things light for this video, which is gonna be kind of hard because this element is, well, dark. God damn what I'm doing with my life making these shit puns. Regardless, I've prepared some dirty pictures for us to share at the end. So power through it and we'll get there together. Upon seeing the stasis trailers, my first thought was entropy. It just fits so well. However, just like with the last video, I am apparently never original, as this topic has already been covered by Reddit user LettuceDifferent5014. He made a brilliant write-up about how stasis is perfect crystals, and that's where a lot of this video comes from. He also made another write-up of an alternate theory of the light elements which I may circle back to at some point and make another video on. Unlike the last video, I won't be quoting quite as much from Lettuce's post, but just keep in mind that probably 30% of this is coming from it. First, let's talk about the who, what, when, where, and why of entropy, and hopefully that'll give us a vague idea of something to build upon. So the modern concept of entropy was first proposed by Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann in 1877. However, the physical quantity had been used by physicists in the decades prior. Boltzmann described entropy as the measure of the number of possible microscopic arrangements or states, microstates, of individual atoms and molecules of a system that comply with the macroscopic condition of the system, macrostate. Uh, okay. Let's back up a bit. In a more general sense and the way it's usually described, entropy is the amount of disorder in a system. A system being the universe or maybe even the inside of your fridge, and disorder possibly being the arrangement and movement of air molecules or the arrangement of your frozen burritos. However, the entropy of your stack of burritos might not be super helpful for us to talk about. Instead, let's think of a much simpler system, a coin, or rather four coins. When you flip it, 
A coin can either land on its heads or its tails. Now, I know what you're thinking. No, can't land on its side. This is a 2D coin we're talking about. You f smart asses. Ugh. Now, there are a couple different ways we can describe this system. We can either list each coin and which side it landed on. And then we'd have a table like this. This is what Boltzmann would call a microstate. Or we could just say that the system had four heads or two heads, two tails or any other possible combination. And this is what Boltzmann would call a macro state. So what does this tell us? Well, for the macro state of four heads, how many micro states are there? There's just one. Same for four tails, because each of the four coins has to be one of those two sides. How about the macro state of one heads and three tails? Well, each of the four coins can be the one that landed on its head, so there are four possible microstates. How about two heads and two tails? Well, there are six possible arrangements there. This means that if we look at all the possible arrangements of our coins, let's say we flip these four coins hundreds of times, the most probable result would be two heads and two tails because it has the most number of microstates. So what does this all mean? Why go on this long-winded tangent about coins and microstates and macrostates? Well, Boltzmann would describe entropy as a function of these microstates and macrostates, a function that looks like this. But don't worry, we're not doing any math here. We're talking about broad concepts. I just wanted you to be exposed to it. More importantly, the flow of entropy is the tendency to move from a more ordered state to a less ordered one or a less probable state to a more probable one. So in our analogy, that would be the four heads moving to two heads, two tails. But to understand why physicists call entropy the amount of disorder in a system, it's easiest to look at elementary particles. For example, in a gas, you have particles zipping all around and colliding into each other. This is a more disorderly state or a state with higher entropy. Whereas in a solid, relatively speaking, particles barely move at all, and they are all arranged in a specific pattern. This is a more ordered state, or a state with lower entropy. Kind of makes sense? Okay, we'll move on. So that's great and all, David, but I haven't even heard you say the word destiny or talk about the freezy ice powers in like five minutes. How does this all relate back? Well, dear viewer, it's the directionality the flow of entropy that's key when we're talking about stasis. The famous second law of thermodynamics states that any closed system has a tendency to move to a state with higher entropy. And since the universe, as far as we know, is a closed system, then the total entropy of everything is always getting larger. Everything, that is, except what we touch with stasis. When we do that, we're actually lowering the entropy. Now, in real life, we can actually lower the entropy in a certain area if we shift it to another area. This is the fundamental concept behind refrigerators. The inside is burr cold, and we shift that entropy outside to the heatsink, which warms up. However, if you look at the system as a whole, meaning the fridge and the surrounding room, the total entropy actually still increases, so it doesn't break the second law of thermodynamics. But stasis? Stasis is special. It allows us to lower the entropy of an area of space without having to raise it elsewhere. So it does, in fact, break this second law, because the darkness gives us this power, and both the light and the dark are both paracausal. They don't have to behave and follow our laws of physics. Actually, Clovis Bray discovered this ignoring of the second law is a property of the darkness itself. He talks about this in his journal, which you can find in the Beyond Light Collector's Edition. He writes, Clarity is not always symmetrical. For example, it violates time reversibility. Consider the simple equation, clarity A to B. This is the application of clarity to state A to produce a lower entropy state B. Clarity is fond of removing portions of a state configuration harrowing the phase space down to only its most robust inhabitants. Here, when Clovis talks about clarity, that's just his name for the darkness. 
Now, entropy is directly related to an object's temperature. All other things being equal, an object with higher entropy will be hotter than an object with lower entropy. In the high entropy object, the particles within are buzzing about erratically, whereas in the low entropy object, everything settles down, and at the far end, this means complete and utter stillness. Everything enters its ground state, and eventually the system reaches absolute zero, the coldest temperature possible. The third law of thermodynamics states that for an object at absolute zero, the atoms inside have stopped moving entirely. Everything is perfectly still. Absolute zero is an interesting topic in and of itself. In scientific units, it's at zero Kelvin. In freedom units, it's negative 459.6 Fahrenheit. And in correct units, it's negative 273.15 Celsius. Since absolute zero requires the stoppage of all thermal motion, i.e. the random movement of particles within an object, it's been thus far impossible for scientists to actually create in the real world. However, great strides have been made, and we've been edging closer and closer to absolute zero. We have liquid nitrogen at 77 Kelvin, and later on we developed liquid helium, which is at 4 Kelvin. Actually, in my undergraduate degree, I got to help build a probe that could measure small variations in liquid helium which is on the order. The closest we've gotten to that holy grail of temperature is with a special type of matter called a Bose-Einstein condensate, or BEC for short. In fact, researchers at MIT were able to cool down a BEC to 450 picokelvin. For those of you at home, that's 0 0.000000045 kelvin. That's insane. This special type of matter is created by using lasers to cool down helium-4 atoms, and this forces them all into the ground state, which causes a sort of chain reaction, forcing the ones around it down into that ground state. And as we know, once everything gets into its ground state, it becomes closer and closer to absolute zero. This is possible because helium-4 atoms are actually bosons, just like photons, and so they can occupy the same state. They're not subject to the Pauli exclusion principle, which you might recall from my previous video. So let's take a step back and really think about what we're saying here. When we use stasis, what we're doing is reducing the entropy in an area, causing the molecules to slow down and stop entirely. Now, since temperature is just the random movement of particles, when we do this, we're causing these particles to get colder and colder until they reach absolute zero which is the coldest a thing can be. This sounds pretty much like what you see in-game. So how does all this explain the stasis crystals? Well, let's take a look at what our friend Lettuce has to say. He says that the stasis crystals aren't ice. They're actually what's called perfect crystals. The definition of which is at absolute zero, the entropy of a perfectly crystalline substance is zero. According to Purdue, 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 according to Purdue University, the crystal must be perfect, or else there will be some inherent disorder. It must also be at zero Kelvin, otherwise there will be thermal motion within the crystal, which leads to disorder. Yeah, I know I'm quoting a quote. Mm, sue me. Lettuce went to the trouble of finding it, so I'm going to the trouble of using it. So the argument goes that when you're reducing the entropy of an object, and therefore its temperature, with stasis, all the way down to zero, what you're actually doing is creating these perfect crystals, not ice crystals. Ice requires the presence of water. Perfect crystals do not. Lettuce elaborates by saying, The structures we are making are not ice, at least not as we know it. They are perfect crystals. A perfect crystal is a crystal that contains no point, line, or planar defects. Imperfections are created by various thermodynamic processes. Whereas ice is a sub-zero temperature solid form of water, a perfect crystal is an absolute zero, perfectly ordered substance in which all the molecules are lined up perfectly and there are no imperfections and therefore has total entropy equal to zero. Now, we don't really have a frame of reference for these perfect crystals. 
as this doesn't exist in nature because it would inherently require it to be at absolute zero, which also doesn't exist. So we know now what these stasis crystals are, but what are they made of? Could they be any material? Well, not every material is normally crystalline. To be crystalline requires the microscopic structure to be ordered and repeating. So quartz and rubies and emeralds, these are all crystalline, but you might not realize so are metals. Things that aren't normally crystalline are things like plastic or rubber or glass or the thing that makes us humans, our stuff. These are not normally crystalline. However, when you reduce the entropy down to zero and reduce its temperature to zero, then any material becomes a perfect crystal. The last question we might ask is why? Why does the darkness reduce entropy like this? What is its end goal? Well, Lettuce would say that by using stasis, by reducing entropy, we're ultimately fulfilling the darkness's wish to bring the universe to its final, ordered shape. He says, negentropy is reverse entropy. It means things becoming more in order. By order is meant organization, structure, and function the opposite of randomness or chaos. One example of negentropy is a star system, such as the solar system. Another example is life. This right here is the end game of the darkness, negentropy. It wishes to reduce the entropy in life forms that do not deserve to exist until all that is left is the final shape in a perfectly ordered universe. The sword logic is a negentropic process that makes killing efficient one that can render one's enemies as something useful. Green soul fire to feed worms or remnants of souls left by the victims of thorn wielders that they can later devour to increase their strength. Anthem anatheme is a negentropic process, the desire to change one's reality to suit one's purposes or to dominate the objective universe with the subjective will. This is what Oryx, Zol, and Omar Aga used to become the touch of malice the Whisper of the Worm, and the Xenophage, respectively. And stasis is a negentropic process which reduces the entropy of our victims to absolute zero, leaving perfectly ordered crystalline structures. Wow, that was a super dense video, much more so than the last one. If you made it through it all and you understood everything, then go ahead and give yourself a pat on the back, because you just endured what is the equivalent of probably a week or maybe even a month of a thermodynamics and statistical mechanics course. So, go you. If not, then maybe give it another watch. It might help my metrics. So what's the too long didn't watch version? Well, stasis is the paracausal reversal of entropy all the way down to zero, causing the temperature to go to absolute zero, which crystallizes the surrounding material. Pretty cool. Regardless, I appreciate you sticking with this video till the end, and just as I promised, I'm going to reward you with some dirty images. Let's see them. Ooh, nice. Ooh. Ooh. That might violate YouTube's guidelines. As I stated previously, I'm going to be posting some lore reading videos from the books that you guys picked. So those are going to be Aspect, The Liar, Dust and Revelation, Aspect being the first one of those. That should be out within the week or so of this release, so keep an eye out for it. Also, I'm going to be sprinkling in some more of those lore tab videos because it seemed like you guys liked them and I enjoyed making them, so keep an eye out for those too. As always, I really appreciate your viewership and I really enjoy reading the fantastic, nice comments that you guys have left, so thank you again. Until next time, Guardians.